Sorry, I have to hit my unmute button. Good afternoon. This is Wednesday, February 1st or February 3rd. It's our recorded class session. And we are talking about trees and Venn diagrams. And then we're going to do a fun probability experiment in section 3.6. Now, I also had questions that were interesting to me as I looked in these two sections. Uh, basically, three, five trees and Venn diagrams, and then three, six probability topics. So I have jotted down two questions. I was searching for a third question, and that was or the fourth question. Example. Three point one eight. I'm just allowing people to come into the room, and I'm already recording the session. But uh, welcome if you've just come in. And again, of course, you can always chat or you can go to audio. So this is our program for today. We're going to look at example three point one eight. We're going to look at problem fifty eight, one fourteen, and one sixteen possibly. And then we're going to do the experiment that's described in section 3.6. If you want to add anything to this list, you'd be my guest. Just type it in the chat or spit it out loud. So let's see which one I want to start with here. I'll start with a just a relaxed warm-up question, possibly. Yeah, so. Let's describe an example of using trees, an example of using Venn diagrams. And when we get into this probability topics experiment, fun thing later, we'll be able to use them again, most likely. But why don't we start with problem number 58. And this would be in the chapter three. Section three, practice problem. At the end of the section, she just lists the problems in order and she lists a bunch of practice and some homeworks. So I'm just gonna go to, oh, excuse me, this is three, five, practice problem. Okay. It says the probability that a man develops some form of cancer in his lifetime is 0.4567. So let's say C is man develops cancer. During his lifetime. You can open your book and read on this, or you can read on this later as you watch this. The probability that the man has at least one false positive test result is 0.51. So let's say P, this is the book, the letter the book uses in this problem man has at least one false positive test result. And they're speaking about when that man is tested for cancer. And when we say at least one, then we mean we're talking about during this person's lifetime. That's how we're going to interpret it. Develops cancer during lifetime has at least one false positive test result during lifetime. Because over the course of your life, 
and developing a relationship with a doctor and a healthcare provider, you've probably had the occasion to take a test for cancer, or you may have the occasion to take a test for cancer, and you may do it multiple times in your life. So the problem tells us that the probability that the person has cancer at least once during his lifetime, 0.4567. It tells us the probability that the person has a false positive result. Now, this is why I don't like using P for false positive. I might have preferred to use F or FP. Why don't we use FP? If it's helpful to you to change the letters, go ahead, because I don't like using P for probability and P for positive. That just is like bound to confuse me. They say this probability is 0 0.5100. A word about uh, the digits I'm using here. Remember 0.45 means 45% and 0.51 means 51%. Now here they had an additional 45.6, 45.67. I could round this off at 45, at 45.7% or at 45.67%. But this speaks about a percentage and taking a percentage to the nearest hundredth is not wrong. So it's not a bad rule of thumb when talking about probabilities or relative frequencies, which are probabilities themselves. They use four decimal places. That's why I wrote the probability that the man has a false positive during his lifetime is 0 0.5100. That doesn't make it different than 0 0.51, just uses all four digits. Now they want us to construct a tree diagram of this situation. Now, the reason why you want to construct a tree, tree diagram is when you want to like consider all possible cases or make sure that you've tracked everything that could happen. And it's particularly nice to draw when you have cases that are this or this. For example, a man either develops cancer during his lifetime or he does not develop cancer during his lifetime. A man either has a false positive test during his lifetime or he does not have a false positive cancer test result when tested for cancer. So those are like mutually exclusive events, naturally separated events. So let's start out like that. There are two groups of men, one that will develop cancer during their lifetime, let's put a C there, and one that will not develop cancer during their lifetime. Now remember we use a prime for not that event. So when you say C prime, you mean not C. I don't mind if you even wrote not C. Sorry, I just kicked my space heater under my desk. So the probability that you're gonna develop cancer in your lifetime if you're a man is 0 0.4567. And that means the probability that you don't develop cancer is the complement of that, one minus that, everything else that could have happened. So if you take one minus 0.467, you get 0 0.5433. To say that you have a 45.67 chance of getting cancer in your lifetime if you're a man is also to say that you have a 54.33 chance of not getting cancer in your lifetime if you're a man. Okay, now let's talk about these two cases of people, the people that develop cancer once in their lifetime and the people who did not. And these people are men. So these people, these men, excuse me, I gotta keep saying men, only because the problem used that case, that group. They either have had a false positive test in their lifetime, or they have not had a false positive test in their lifetime. 
again, those are mutually exclusive. You can't both have a false positive test during your life and not have a false positive test during your life. And the same thing for the people that did not develop cancer in their lifetime. They either had a false positive test or they did not. What are the probabilities of a false positive test? 0 0.5100. That means the probability that you do not have a false positive test for cancer during your lifetime if you're a man is 0 0.4900. Zero, zero. And the same probabilities apply even if the person didn't have cancer during their lifetime. Having cancer and having a false positive test result are independent. You can have one or the other. Now the branches of these trees give us the different things that have, could have happened to man during their lifetime. And you can break these men now up into four categories the probability that they had a false positive test given that they had cancer, is this branch, here's the probability, I wanna say it differently, so I'll cross this out carefully. This branch, this person had cancer and had a false positive test. This person had cancer and did not have a false positive test. This person did not have cancer, but had a false positive test somewhere during their life. And this person did not have cancer and did not have a false positive test. I find the probabilities of each of these four outcomes just by multiplying along the branches. So I'm gonna do that on my calculator and I'm not gonna show you the calculator, I'm just multiplying these two numbers and I'll tell you what the result is. You can check it on your calculator. 4567 times 0 0.5100. Zero. This is 0 0.23. Two, nine, I rounded off to four digits. Point four, five, six, seven times point four, nine, zero, zero, zero point two, two, three, eight. Now we talk about probability of not having cancer and having a false positive test. That's 0 0.5433 times 0 0.5100. 0 0.2771. And the last one, probability of not having cancer during the lifetime and not having a false positive test. 0.5433 times 0 0.4900, 0 0.2662. Now notice if you add these cases up, that because of a rounding, it may or may not turn into exactly one, but every man has to fit into one of these four categories. And none of these four categories could happen at the same time. There's no overlap. So if you add 17, zero, carry the two, four, seven, 14, zero, carry the two, and then say five, seven, 14, zero, carry the two, zero, carry the one, it doesn't always have to be exactly one because I may have rounded off and got caught with an extra digit. 
but you see that these are all the things that could happen to a man in their lifetime. Why would you want a tree diagram like this? Well, you'd like to investigate how likely a bad result is. Let's consider these four possibilities. Cancer false positive, cancer not false positive, cancer not cancer and false positive, or not cancer and not false positive. Now, everybody can have a different feeling about this, but let's say we pick out one as a bad result. If you had cancer and you had a false positive test, you might consider that a good result. At least they were gonna check you for cancer and then see whether or not you had it. Now the question is you might not have had the test at the same time. If you had cancer and did not have a false positive test result, you know, perhaps you had another test later that detected that. If you did not have cancer and you had a false positive test result, you know, that could be worrisome. I'd like to know, I'd rather know, I'd rather have my doctor check these things out, but this case right here, you know, it might cause some anxiety. If you did not have cancer and you did not have a false positive test result, you know, that means that your test results came back always correctly and you didn't have cancer during your lifetime. I don't think you'd be worried about that situation. I think you're worried about the case where you had cancer and a false positive test result, or you did not have cancer and you had a false positive test result. So let's look at these two cases in particular. If you do not have cancer, but you have a false positive test result, that happens about 27.7%, almost 28% of the time, according to these figures. So that by far, even though it was only by a single percentage point, was the biggest case right here. If you had cancer and had a false positive test result, that was about 23.29%. So I think right now I'd be most concerned about not having cancer and getting a false positive test result. I've got a 27.78 chance of experiencing that unnecessary concern. Maybe you've been in that position. Now you're gonna ask me, wouldn't you be much more concerned if you had cancer and you had a negative test result? But let's look at this. They did not talk about positive test results or negative test results. They just talked about false positive test results. Maybe it concerns you that the false positive test results were kind of 50-50. In general, a cancer test result is gonna be much better than 50-50, but the false positive rate might be high why would you want to have a test with a positive, with a false positive rate that's high? Because if you're testing someone for a serious illness, what do you want your test to be? You want your test to be very, very sensitive. You know, because if someone has cancer and your test doesn't detect it, that's probably a bad event that's probably a bad thing to happen. So in general, for a cancer test, you're gonna want them to be extremely sensitive. But the price you pay for that test, you know, that hair trigger test, so to speak, that very sensitive test, is that you probably have a relatively high false positive rate. 
And then the cost of having that sensitive test with a high false positive rate is that approximately 27.7, 28% of the time, you will alarm someone who does not have cancer. So what does the doctor have to do? What does the company have to do that's making these tests? They have to say 28% of the time, we're going to alarm someone who doesn't have cancer. On the other hand, we know that we get positive test results on people that have cancer 99% of the time, maybe higher or lower. I don't know much about medical tests. So detecting people that actually have cancer correctly is probably worth the cost of a little more than one in four tests coming back with false positives when people don't have cancer. Okay, so here's a tree diagram. Helps you decide between cases when you have multiple things to consider. So this is problem 58. Let me look at example 318 or 114. I want to decide which one I check out first. 114, 116. Let's do another tree diagram in 116. And then you can, 114 is laid out for you in the book. So Let's do 116 and then you can go check 114. We'll do 318, then we'll get to the M&Ms. So this is problem number 116. And this is in chapter three. This is taken from section 3.5 again, tree diagrams and Venn diagrams. And this is a practice problem. Just to help you get oriented to the book. Okay, so we have a box of cookies and the box of cookies has three chocolate cookies and seven butter cookies. Three chocolate cookies. Let's call those C for chocolate cookie and seven butter cookies. Let's call that B for butter cookies. And that means there are 10 cookies in this box. Miguel randomly selects a cookie and eats it. Then he randomly selects another cookie and eats it. So question asked, how many cookies did he take? He took two cookies. And this is a case, thankfully, of selecting some items at random without replacement. He didn't pick a cookie out of the box, ask what it was and put it back. He took a cookie out of the box and he ate it, no matter which one it was. So the second cookie he took out of the box, now there was only nine cookies in the box. So you might ask, what's the probability that he ate two chocolate cookies? What's the probability that he ate one of each? What's the probability that he ate two butter cookies? Since there's just two kinds of cookies and a choice each time, this is very natural again for a tree. The first cookie he took could have been a butter cookie. <coughs> the first cookie he took could have been a chocolate cookie. The odds of taking a butter cookie, the probability of taking a butter cookie first pick was seven out of 10. Now, I could write that as a decimal too, but let's practice writing things as fractions. Probability that the first cookie was a chocolate cookie is three out of 10. You see that they have to add up to one because there are no other cookies in the box. Now let's try it again. The second cookie he took could have been a butter cookie or a chocolate cookie. 
But if he's already taken a butter cookie, there are only six butter cookies left in the nine butter cook in the nine cookies left in the box. How many chocolate cookies are there in the box? Three chocolate cookies of the nine in the box. These are probabilities that are different than the first choice because he's destroyed a cookie. The probabilities have changed. What if he first took a chocolate cookie? Second cookie could be peanut butter or chocolate. I'm gonna change it to peanut butter, but butter, peanut butter. And if he's taken a chocolate cookie, what's the probability that it takes a butter cookie on the second try? Seven butter cookies, nine cookies left. Chocolate cookie, now there's only two chocolate cookies, nine cookies left. Do you see that each time you make a branch, the probabilities have to add up to one? Six nights plus three nights is one. Seven nights plus two nights is one. That's because those are all the things that could happen. There were no lemon cookies in the box. So now let's take the probability that his first cookie was a butter cookie and his second cookie was a butter cookie. In the book, sometimes they write this butter cookie one and butter cookie two, but we could just say butter cookie, butter cookie. That's fine. So this would be seven tenths times six ninths. And that may or may not become a nice number. Sorry, I always put my paper forward while I'm working. That may or may nice become a nice number, right? I'm just gonna multiply it and make it a decimal. So seven tenths times six ninths. I'm gonna do this again off screen. These are just basic multiplications I'm doing. 0 0.4667 probability that butter cookie in first, chocolate cookie second, that'd be 7 tenths, 3 ninths, and that is 2333. Three, three. I'm always running off to four digits. Probability that he took a chocolate cookie the first time and a butter cookie the second time. That is 3 tenths times 7 ninths. Notice 3 tenths times 7 ninths is the same as 7 tenths times 3 ninths. I just rearranged the order of the numbers on the bottom. So that is also 2, 3, 3, 3. And what's the probability that it took a chocolate cookie and a chocolate cookie? That's what I'm looking for because I like the chocolate cookies. 3 tenths times 2 ninths, 5 over 90, but as a decimal, that's 0 0.0556. I'm going to be disappointed. Less than a 6% chance of getting two chocolate cookies because there weren't too many cookies in the box. So what's the probability of getting one of each? You know, be prepared that people will describe the events to you in different ways. What's one of each in this case? Probability of butter cookie than chocolate cookie? Plus probability of chocolate cookie than butter cookie. That's the only way to get one of each. The other two are the same cookie. And that, if you add these together, is 0 0.4667. Now, 4666 as we round off, but if you took these two fractions added together, you get 4667. I'll write 4666 as we wrote it. That's equal to the probability of getting two butter cookies, do you notice? What if someone asked you the question this way? What's the probability of getting no chocolate cookie? You have to interpret that. What does no chocolate cookie mean in this tree? No chocolate cookie in this tree means 
two butter cookies. So don't expect people to say things to you exactly as you want them said to you. You gotta be flexible. Now here's a cooler question. What is the probability that you will get a chocolate cookie on your second try? If you got a butter cookie on the first try. Uh, I'll show you two different ways to do this. The formula by the book, what does conditional probability means? It means chocolate cookie on second try and butter cookie on first try divided by butter cookie on first try. So let's work it out by this formula. Then I'll show you how you could have worked it out otherwise. What's the probability to get a butter cookie on the first try? That's seven tenths. What's the probability of getting a chocolate cookie in the second try and a butter cookie on the first try? Well, that's this branch of the tree, chocolate cookie on second try and butter cookie on first try. That's the only way you could do it. None of the other branches match. This is 0.233. Notice that 7 tenths times 3 ninths. I could do it with the decimals, but the reason I choose to do it with the 7 tenths times 3 ninths right here, 7 tenths times 3 ninths I took from right there, is because the 7 tenths literally cancel out, and I have 3 ninths, which is 1 and 3. So the probability of me getting a chocolate cookie that the first cookie I selected was a butter cookie has improved, right? Ordinarily, first probability of getting a chocolate cookie is three out of 10, but now it's one out of three. Because I picked a butter cookie, I have a better chance of getting a chocolate cookie the second time. If I had picked a chocolate cookie the first time, I'd have a worse chance of getting a chocolate cookie the second time. As a decimal, this is three, 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 three. Now, I also see this number immediately in the table because I could say to myself, well, if I know I picked a butter cookie on the first try, then I know I'm in this first branch. And I know there are only nine cookies left and I know that three of them are chocolate. So I could calculate that also directly. Three chocolate cookies left, nine cookies total. I know that there's a one in three chance of me getting a chocolate cookie after I pick that peanut butter cookie first. So I just want you to look at that either way, from the formula or from the counting. Okay, good. So I'm just going through here relatively fast. I agree. Maybe I'll do one more example, then we'll do the M&Ms. Uh, the reason is I'm trying to go through here relatively quickly and just work on the problems is I think last time I got distracted talking about baseball and I apologize for that. I just was interested in baseball. I liked the question that was about baseball, but let's just see if we can crunch through some problems here. And there, every topic when we're doing this is very interesting and exciting. Every topic is interesting and exciting to, to someone Maybe it's baseball to you, maybe it's automobile insurance to someone else. But let's just focus on doing the problems. I'll try to do that. Okay, I want to look at example 318. 
and this is also about cancer and also about a cancer test. So let's go back a little bit to that first problem we did. This time we're going to talk about the probability of a woman who lives to 90 developing breast cancer. So let's say C this time is the, pro is the event that a woman who lived to 90 years has developed breast cancer. Now there are not a lot of people, men or women, that live to 90 years. So we're talking about a relatively special group and we want to know in that relatively long life, did the person, the woman develop breast cancer? And we're told the probability of that is 14.3%, one in seven, or I'll do one in seven on my calculator. Zero point one four two nine. I'm just gonna go to four decimal places as a habit. Now remember, and this is why you should write these things down whenever you do a problem. C here means cancer, but not a man developing cancer during his whole life, but a woman developing a particular kind of cancer in the first 90 years of life. Someone who did not live to 90 years, a woman who did not live to 90 years is not in this group. The woman might have developed breast cancer and died for an unrelated reason when she was 65. So this is a very special group. It's like men who develop cancer during their whole lifetime is a particular group. I use the letter C twice, but you just know what you're using the letters for, so you write them down. Now, here's the next question. A woman who has developed cancer. So given that they have developed breast cancer, the test is negative 2% of the time. So now they give us another result. Given that the woman has developed cancer, we have a negative test and I'm gonna use N for negative cancer test. This is 0 0.02. They labeled it as 2% but I write it as a decimal 0 0.0200. Do you see? You can do probability as a fraction, as a percentage, or as a decimal. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier when I said that's a good thing, that probability that you have a negative test result if you have cancer, you want that to be low. You want that test to be very sensitive. So let's write down what N is. A negative test result. Now, not a negative test result for anyone on the street. A negative test result for a woman that has cancer, has breast cancer. Okay, I'm gonna to have to adjust something I already wrote here. I can't say this twice, given that they have breast cancer. That's already incorporated into my statement. N is a negative test result for a woman that has breast cancer. That's what I was told. So this extra statement is unnecessary. Probability that the 
test is negative for a woman that has breast cancer is very low, 98% accuracy, or 98% of the time it finds breast cancer. Only 2% of the time you get a negative test result. Now let's turn the page. I'm gonna turn the page here and just pick up a couple of these problems. So what is the probability that a woman develops breast cancer? What is the probability that that woman tests negative? Okay. I have to change what I wrote here, excuse me. So I'm not, I gotta read the whole question right here. I think we were correct to say negative given that the person has cancer because they defined negative in the problem. So I'm gonna rewrite that. If you make a mistake, don't worry about it. Cross it out clearly and write it over again. So let's let B be the woman developing breast cancer. They wanted to sign their own letters. And let's let N be the result that you have a negative cancer test result. And they say that that happens negative cancer test result 85% of the time. Now what we'd like to know is if there's any false negatives here. So the first question they ask you in this problem is, what's the probability that the woman develops breast cancer? That's the 0.1429. What's the probability that They test negative. And they say in the problem that's 0 0.8500. Now they ask the question, given that the woman has breast cancer, the B, what is the probability she tests negative? And that was given to me as the 0. 0.2002%. What is the probability that the woman has breast cancer and tests negative? That would be a negative result. That would be a bad thing. Well, let's work this out from our formula. Remember formula for conditional probability. Probability of having a negative test result given that you have cancer, breast cancer, is a probability of negative test result and breast cancer divided by the probability that you have breast cancer. In this problem, the probability that you develop breast cancer is one in seven, 0 0.1429. And the probability that you have a negative test and you develop ca breast cancer, you don't know. That's what you'd like to find out because that would be a very bad situation. But you do know that the test is very sensitive the probability that you have a negative test given that you have breast cancer is very low. So how are you gonna find the probability of having a negative test result and having breast cancer? You're gonna multiply the probability of having a negative test result given that you had breast cancer times the probability of breast cancer. You're gonna multiply these two numbers, 2% 2 times 0.1429. When I do that on my calculator, what do I learn? 
1 divided by 7 times 0 0.02, I get 0 0.00. .00 Two nine. I read that correctly. That is not 29%. That's 10%, 1%. That's way less than 1%. And this is reassuring. What's the probability that you have breast cancer and the test says you do not? Because this test is so tense sensitive, they say the probability is less than 1% a little bit more than a quarter of 1%, certainly less than a half of 1%. Okay, that's good. That's a good result. Pick out another question they ask you in this example. Are having breast cancer and testing negative independent events. Let's do one more problem in this example. What does it mean for independent events? What does it mean for two events to be independent? Having the probability of one does not influence the probability of the other that means they're independent. So you could say either probability of breast cancer given that you have a negative test result or the probability that you have a negative test result given that you have breast cancer. If the first is the same as the probability of having breast cancer, then these two results are independent. The negative test result did not influence the chance of having breast cancer. You could do it this way. Probability of having a negative test result given that you had breast cancer and the probability of having negative test result at all. Let's calculate these. Well, I was told that this first one was 0 0.0200. I was told that the second one, having a negative test result probability was 85%. These are not equal. So this is an independent result. These two events, having breast cancer I'm sorry, and having a negative test, they are dependent results. So N and B are dependent. Independent means they're equal. You might worry about this first case right here, but I haven't calculated the probability of having breast cancer given that I had a negative test. I just calculated the probability of having breast cancer and having a negative test. Let me do some scratch work up here. What's the probability of having breast cancer given that I had a negative test? Well, it's the probability of having breast cancer and a negative test, which I just worked out was very low, divided by the probability of having a negative test. That's the formula for conditional probability. This breast cancer and negative test is 0 0.0029, very small. The probability of having a negative test is 0. 8.5. So what's the probability of having breast cancer given that your test was negative? You want to avoid that too, right? You don't want to be told you had a negative test and then later find out you had breast cancer. 
I'll, multi I'll divide those two numbers on my calculator. And that is 0 0.0034. Also very small. So both these things are good. The probability of having breast cancer and a negative test is very small, 0.29%. The probability of having breast cancer, given that I've told you you have a negative test, is also small, 0 0.0034. The probability of having breast cancer at all, remember, was 0 0.1483. Sorry, 1429. Again, relatively small, one and seven, though. Both of those are small, but they're not equal. So these events are not independent. These events are dependent. Either way you look at them, these events are dependent. Okay. I haven't done an example of a Venn diagram yet. Maybe I'm gonna put that off because I want to go do the M&M &M experiment in detail with you. So let me set these papers aside. And let me pull up the M&M &M experiment, M &M experiment on our book and share it with you online. And then, you know, I'd, I'd like you to go and practice this yourself, but it takes some time because you got to run several experiments. I said you could do it with M&Ms. I said you could do it with beans. But I told you I was not going to do it with M&Ms because I would just eat the M&Ms. I probably have enough self-control to avoid that but I could just picture what would happen. I'd have a big bag of M&Ms sitting in the kitchen and every day I would just eat a couple more. And one day I would be feeling rough, so I'd eat a whole handful. Let me show you how you could do this entirely on your calculator. And you could apply this to lots of different experiments. So if you don't have the M&Ms or if you don't have the 10 dice, you know, you can have your calculator simulate things. So I'm gonna pull this up on our screen and share it with you. And then I'll show you how I did the results just simulating the M&Ms of different colors on my calculator. It's not that hard to do. Okay, so first I'm going to, and I'll show you on my calculator on screen. Uh, let me share a screen. Let me get a browser going on. Got the browser, yes. In the browser, I'm sharing the browser. Yes, I am. Okay. I don't always see my mouse. You see my mouse, but then if I move it quickly, the screen rate doesn't catch up to it. So here's, the probability topic, here's the stats lab where you're going to play with the M&Ms. I don't think I can make this too much larger. I can make it a little bit larger, but this is literally section three, six in your book. So if we were face to face, we'd have some fun to do this in class. And what is our goal here? We want to remind you about the difference between calculating some probability in theory and calculating the actual probability observed in real life. Remember, you have this idea that if you flip a coin, it's supposed to come up heads and tails equally often. But then you play a game with your friend where, you know, every head gets a dollar and every tail gets a dollar for her. Every head gets a dollar for you, every tail gets a dollar for her. And then we flip the coin 10 times and she comes up with seven tails and you lose money. You say, what went wrong? You were using a cheating coin. Well, probably not, unless she's got some special coin from a trick shop, magician shop maybe. Just because the theoretical probability is one half doesn't mean 
that every time you flip a coin four times, you get two heads. Every time you flip a coin 100 times, you get 50 heads. It does mean that the more often you flip, the closer you'll get to 50-50, the closer you get to 50% heads. That's what they're trying to illustrate in this problem. So here's the experiment that we're going to do on a calculator. Count out 40 M&Ms, a small bag's worth. Uh, I think small bag, they mean a, not the Halloween bag, which might have about 15, 16, 17, 18. I think they mean a bag from a vending machine. And they give you these colors, yellow, green, blue, brown, orange, and red. From time to time, there are other colors, but these are the standard M&M colors. Now, your bag of M&Ms from the vending machine will be different than mine. So they say, why don't you write down how many of each M&M you have? And then how likely it is you choose each M&M for various experiments. You don't expect if there are six colors and you got 40 M&Ms, well, it's definitely true that you can't have the same number of each color because six doesn't go in evenly to 40. But it could be wildly off too. So let me show you on a calculator how to pick 40 M&Ms and record six different colors randomly. First, I'm gonna get out my sheet of paper right here and share it with you. And then I'm gonna to go to my calculator. What I did is I already performed this experiment just to see how it would work. So back to the paper. I simulated 40 M&Ms and I got five yellows, two greens, eight blues, eight browns, six oranges, and 11 reds. Now let me show you how I did that on a calculator. I'm gonna to go to my calculator screen. I could also pull the calculator in front of you here, but it's relatively small, harder to read. So let me go to my calculator screen. on the calculator screen right now. And see how that shows up on your screen. I just wanna keep an ID on it. What I got here is all the buttons on the left, but then the main screen on the middle and then other screens here could be on the right side. So what I wanna go is to the math command and you can watch my key history down the bottom. Math command gives me choices for probability, I'm showing you this once, I'm gonna arrow over to the probability. I could use the arrow key here, or I could just use the arrow key on my keyboard since I'm using calculator. Either way, it records, I did three arrow keys. That's how it does that. There's a little three with an arrow key. Now, I want to pick a random integer between one and six. Right? Let's give each color a number in the order they listed it. And I could, if one represents yellow, I could pick one more than once. And I want to do it 40 times. So I'm not going to choose the no repeat. I'll use no repeat later. Let's choose random integer. So I'm going to choose number five. Click number five. And I want to choose between one and six, because I've got six M&Ms. I want to make 40 choices and then have the calculator show me 40 simulated M&Ms. That's the command if you typed it in yourself directly. Some calculators, you have to type it in yourself directly like that. Then you have to know what order to put the numbers in. So here are my M&Ms. 
every time, you see I've got 40 M&Ms here, if I arrow over, I've literally got 40 M&Ms. And I would go through the whole list. Let's go back to the beginning. And I'll call one yellow in the order they gave me. Three will be blue. Six will be red. Two will be green. Five will be orange. And four will be brown. Do you see that I don't have any brown ones yet? Let's go arrow over. Oh, there's a brown one. Took me a long time to get a brown one. Do you see that like that brown one might not be too plentiful? That's interesting. Do you want to see how we could do this in your list? So what if I went to stats, edit stats list, and let's clear out this L1. We're going to hit clear. And then I'll type in the random command there by getting either math, probability, random integer, one to six, 40 times, and pasting it right on that list. Look at that, it pasted the list for me. And now I've got 40 M&Ms, except I've got numbers instead of colors. Now you don't want to go through this list and you know do what? Have to count all the ones. But what I could do here is put them in order. Let me show you how to put this list in order, ascending order. L2, stats, press the stat button. I'm going to clear this stack so you can see what I'm doing. Sorry, I walked away from my window. L2. Stats, sort A, sort D. That says sort ascending and sort descending. Let's sort ascending. So I hit number two. And let's sort ascending that list one. Remember list one I've already put in there as some random M&Ms. Sort, ascending, list, one, close parentheses. Now, the calculator doesn't tell me what the new list is. It just says, I did it. So let's go back to list one and see that they sorted it. How many yellows do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many reds do I have? Uh, sorry, green is the next color. I'll check out how many twos I have. One, two, three, four, five. Five twos. How many threes do I have? Twos were greens, so I had five greens, seven yellows. Wow, I got a big stack of threes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine threes. Now, if this list was very long, I wouldn't enjoy this. So I'd have to come up with a different way of doing this. But now you see I have six fours. Fours were brown. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six fives. Fives were orange. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven reds. Reds were six. OK, I'm going to leave the calculator right now. But I'll come back to it later to show you some other ways I could calculate. I wanna clear this before I go on because this is not my M&M collection. Good. So let's go back to my paper and we'll show you what we did. So I used random, integer 
from one to six 40 times. Start and 40 times. And then I counted ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes. Now, when I did it yesterday, I got five yellows, two greens, that's disappointing, eight blues, eight browns, six oranges, and 11 reds. So now it asks you in the book to fill in a probability table. Let's go to the probability table. Again, I've already filled it in and I'll calculate one or two with you. Because what you're gonna do is pick probabilities. You're gonna pick two M&Ms, one and then a next one. You're gonna pick first M&M, second M&M. And you'd like to know what the probability is that both of them are red. You'd like to know what the probability is that the second is green, given that the first is red. You'd like to know what the probability is, I said X1, X2, that they match. Let's let X1, X2 stand for any color, but both the same. Same color on both draws, or pulling doubles. Let's do the probability that you don't pull doubles. Let's do the probability that you do not pick yellow on either turn. That means no yellow on the first and no yellow on the second. They just picked some examples. You could make many more experiments up. But they want to show you that the difference between doing with replacement and without replacement that it makes a difference whether you put the first M&M &M back before you pick the second. When you're asking students in your classroom how many hours they gamed last week, you'd like to pick four students out of the 15 people in your class. Do you pick the first person and then put them back and pick the second person? Commonly, you don't. Usually, you number the people in the room and then you pick two random numbers. But if you were making a true random sample, what you'd have to do is put the 15 names in a hat, pull out the name, ask them how many hours they gamed last week, put the name back in the hat, pull it out again. That would be with replacement. If you just pick two slips of paper out of the hat, they cannot be the same. That's called without replacement. With replacement, you might accidentally pick the same person twice, even though if it's of unlucky. What if you had 10,000 people in your class? Would it make any difference between with replacement and without replacement? No, it'd be very unlikely with replacement that you'd pick the same person twice. Take the example of 100,000 people in the football stadium at U of M. Right? If you just wanted to pick one at random, it'd be very hard to pick the same one twice if you were really being random. So then replacing or not replacing wouldn't make any difference to you. But in a smaller group, like the 15 people in your class, replacing or not replacing might make a difference. What about in 40 M&Ms? Does it make a difference whether I do the probabilities with replacement or without replacement. Now these are theoretical probabilities. I'll do the experiment in a second, but let's do the probability on a piece of paper. You know, let's pick one of these out. I cannot do all of these in front of you right now. We don't have that time, but let's pick one of them out like red on the first and green on the second. Now the probability of red is 11 out of 40. And if you put that back, you'll still have 40 M&Ms in the bag. So what's the probability of getting green on the second pick? 
not very many greens in the bag, 40 in the bag, your probability of getting red on the first pick is 11 40ths. Your probability of getting green on the second pick is 2 40ths. Are you allowed to simply multiply those probabilities? When are you allowed to multiply probabilities with the and? Earlier in the chapter, the book said to you, as long as these are independent, you can just multiply these. Is the probability of getting red on the first independent of the probability of getting green on the second? Yeah, if I pick a red on the first one and put it back in the bag, that's not going to change the probability of getting a green on the second one. So I multiply these and I get on the calculator 11 divided by 40 times 2 divided by 40. I won't go to my screen calculator for that. 0. Point Zero one three seven five. Zero one three eight. If I round off to four decimal places, that's very low. Just a bit over one percent. Why is it so low? Because there are not many greens in the deck, in the bag, and so that's why I wrote that's zero one three eight right here. Now, what's the probability of getting red and green with replacement? That's the point zero one three eight. What's the probability without replacement? Well, the probability of getting red on the first and green on the second. The first time you pick, you have 11 reds in the bag and 40 overall, but you don't put the red back. So what's the probability of getting green on the second pick? Probability of red on the first pick is 11 out of 40. Probability of getting green on the second pick is what? By the time you take that second pick, there are two greens in the bag, definitely, but there are only 39 in the bag. So can you take 11 40ths times 2 39ths? That's the first thing I'd like to say. That's the first thing I'd like to do, to do multiply these two to get that. But are these independent events? What's the probability? Let's just test it just to see what happens. It may not be a very big difference, but it might be a difference. What's the probability of getting green on the second pick given that you had red on the first pick? What's the probability of having green on the second pick and red on the first pick? Divided by the probability that you have red on the first pick. Now, you know the probability of having red on the first pick is 11 out of 40. And you know the probability of having green on the second pick and red on the first pick. Now, here's where a tree comes in. I have green on the first pick and red on the second pick. I'm sorry green on the second pick and red on the first pick. 
So let's say red on the first pick, green on the second pick. The probability of getting red on the first pick was what? 11 for 40. The probability of getting green on the second pick, because there was only two greens in and 39 left, is two out of 39. So what's the probability of getting red on the first pick and green on the second pick? You multiply these two, you get 11 over 40 times two over 39. The 11 over 40s cancel and the probability of getting green on the second pick, given that you had red on the first pick was two 39ths. Notice that the same as probability of getting green on the second pick. You've done this without replacement. So I can multiply these two. I have two out of 39. And what does the calculator tell me this is? It's gonna be slightly different than that. Is it gonna be higher or lower? We're going to change that 40 to 39. 0 0.0141. So that's the number I filled in right here. Now I'm going to do another number with you just to get going. But see, the problem here is that we're gonna spend a lot of time working out these numbers. And if you worked out these numbers, yours are gonna be different than mine. But do you see that there's always a slight difference between with replacement and without replacement? Just a slight difference. What's the probability of pulling two reds with replacement? It's better because you have more reds in the bag if you pick a red and then replace it. What's the probability of getting a green on the second, given that you had a red on the first. It's better without replacement because you've eliminated one red from the bag. You have fewer things in the bag. With replacement, it's just the probability of getting a green in general, which is 0.5. So all these you have to calculate, but they're calculated based on your distribution of M&Ms, not mine. So if you redo this problem, you're going to have different probabilities here. <coughs> now let's get to the place where I did the experiment. They said, do this 24 times and find out what you got. So I'll show you the page where I did it 24 times. And I got two reds when I did with replacement. I got two reds only once. That's 0 0.0417. I expected that the probability would be 0 0.0756. I'm in the same ballpark, but it shouldn't happen exactly like I wanted it to happen. How about the probability of red, black, uh, red brown, then brown red? That only happened to me once. But in general, it should have happened 11% of the time. So I got a little bit unlucky there. Probability that I have red on the first and green on the second, it actually never happened with replacement or without. So I have to say zero empirical results, zero observed. That does not mean it's impossible to get red on the first and green on the second, it just means it didn't happen to me. Let's look at this one, red on the first, brown on the second or brown on the first, red on the second. Without replacement, that happened to me three times in 24, one eighth of the time. Now up here, it should have happened 0.1128 probability. That's pretty close, 0 0.1250, 0 0.1128. So sometimes I'm closer, sometimes I'm not close. What's the probability of not getting doubles, not having the same color twice? I calculated it with replacement to be 82%, but my experiment showed 75%. I calculated it with replacement to be 
a little over 80%. And my experiment gave me no doubles almost 80% of the time, pretty close. Let me show you my experiment and let me show you how I did this on the calculator. So here I simulated taking 24 experiments where I pulled one M&M and then pulled another. Here's with replacement, here's without replacement. 24 pairs, orange and green, red and brown. B stands for brown, he used BL for blue. That's a little bit distracting. Oh, here's a double, two oranges. Uh, did I get any other doubles? Here's two oranges. Any other doubles? Oh, two blue browns, two browns. So I got a fair number of doubles there. How about without replacement? Did I get any doubles? Uh, I got blue, blue here. We got brown, brown, orange, 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 orange. So I got a fair amount of doubles. How did I tell the calculator to pick M&Ms of different colors? So this I might do on the calculator in front of you so you can watch. Let's do it this way. And I might raise, and this is gonna be the last thing I do anyway, because we're running out of time, but I might raise my calculator here so you can see it a little bit better. Think about my 40 M&Ms. I've got five that are yellow, two that are green, eight that are blue, eight that are brown, six that are orange, and 11, lots of reds. So it's like they take up a space in this rectangle. I could tell the calculator to pick a number between one and 40. And that will correspond to the color I picked. I can tell the calculator to do that with or without replacement. I could take two numbers between one and 40, like this. Clear, math, probability. Let's take two random integers from one to 40. And I did not say they're different. I just want two. And what's the result? I picked a 13 and a 28. What's the 13? 13 is blue, 28 is orange. So I picked blue orange right there. Let's do it again, second function entry. I picked this time 1438. That is blue and red. Let's do it one more time. Now remember, I'm not allowing, or I am allowing repeats, but still choosing between 40 numbers only twice, it's not likely to get a repeat. I, it would be nice to get a repeat here just to illustrate it, but I don't think it's gonna happen. 12 and 16, what did I pick? I picked a blue and a brown. Can I get the same color twice? That'd be nice. 30 and 39. Oh, I did. Red and red. Here's two reds. Now this is picking with replacement. Let's go pick two M&Ms without replacement. Go back to math, back to probability. Random integer, no repeats. From one to 40, I want to pick two integers. That'll represent two M&Ms. But this time I will forbid repeating. I didn't see any repeating last time anyway. That might not happen. Okay, no repeats. One and 17, that's yellow and brown. Do it again. 36, 21, that's red and brown. One more time, 25 and two, that's orange and yellow. Okay, this is how I wrote down these 24 M&Ms with replacement and 24 M&Ms without replacement, since I didn't wanna go buy some M&Ms and start eating them. Then I calculated these probabilities, then, I match them up against what I thought would happen. Most of the time, what happened is close 
but not exact to what I thought would happen. A couple of things I made a cross out error here. You know, you're gonna make errors from time to time. If you write in pencil, you could just erase them. Since I was writing in pen, I had to cross it out and write down the correct answer. If you do that, just make sure people understand what is the correct number? Where do you want it to be? What did you cross out? What is the correct thing? You can just cross out something once. Don't scribble it out or destroy it. Just cross it out once. Okay, go and perform that experiment with yourself on your calculator because it is a good idea to know how to make your calculator pretend to do a random experiment. Now, is it truly, truly random? Can a machine ever do something that's truly, truly random? Well, the giant answer in the whole universe is no, not really. Now there's, you know, people debate about this, but a machine does things with programs and programs are not random. But could a machine simulate randomness? Well, only if I helped it. And so actually when people really need random numbers, they have to work very, very hard or use some other special accident, like a decaying atom or something else like that, radioactive element. I don't wanna get into that. Right now, let's just say your calculator does a very good job of picking random numbers. Not perfect, but very good. Okay, let me save this. Let me upload it and we'll see you guys next week, but have fun doing this experiment just to calculate some probabilities and see how, come real how close reality comes to that. I apologize because I have to go directly to another meeting and I've kept you a little bit long, but I'm just gonna wrap this up in the meeting. Thank you, enjoy the rest of your week too. And we'll get back to you next week. Have a good weekend.